I want to begin with a quote from Winston Churchill. The farther you look behind, the farther you can see ahead. In order to see ahead the next five years, the 10 years, 50 years, you have to look behind that much. Why? Because it is a single road. It goes here. It doesn't start suddenly. It draws on everything that went before it and becomes something new. So to begin this discussion, I want to begin with technology, because there is a belief here that technology is the key to geopolitical power. Well, perhaps it is. But let's first discuss technology. So for example, this is an iPhone. You, have, you must have many of them. It's obviously a useful tool, and you have no idea of its history. I will now tell you its history. The cell phone was developed by the United States Army in the 1970s. It was first deployed by the US Army. So your cell phone is a military tool. The microchip was commissioned by the US Air Force to fly the F-14 and also cruise missiles. GPS, you used that to find your way around. So did the US Navy, which commissioned the building of the GPS squadron so its submarines could know where they are. There's, of course, the camera. We all love the camera. I don't, but my wife does. It was developed for a space satellite so that the film did not have to be dropped to Earth. It took pictures that could be transmitted as data to Earth. And of course, there's the internet, without which this wouldn't have any place, which is developed by DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, to move information from one point to another quickly so we didn't have to mail it. In other words, to understand the technology of this age, you must understand the geopolitical requirements of the United States, the military that it created, and the technology that it really cre created as well. So you cannot look at the cell phone, the iPhone, the very cute little thing, the camera and everything else, without understanding its military origins. Now, what does this have to do with history? Well, the question is, how does Dubai or any country develop a military capability in the age of uh, all these new technologies that are inviting? The answer is, look to your defense department. Look to your defense ministries. Why? Because the United States did something to create this technology. Not because it wanted to have a cell phone for you to use, but because it was trying to solve military problems. And those military problems had application to Apple. And Steve Jobs stole all these ideas. But in America, it's not stealing, because the US government is not permitted to hold on to technology. It cannot patent technology unless it's classified, and this wasn't. So he simply went and got together all this technology that was already there and used it. So the first element of new technology, artificial intelligence, or whatever you want to have, the first foundation of it has to be a need by some organization with enough money to invent the solution. And then the state must be generous at letting the private sector have it. If the United States refused to give it out, which, by the way, the Soviets also developed but wouldn't give out, we wouldn't have that technology now today. So there's an intimate connection, not between what technology is going to do for geopolitics, but what geopolitics does for technology. And if you look at the iPhone and think about it, 
And you think about the mines you have here in Dubai and the resources and the money that you have here in Dubai, you understand the first thing that you must do is define your geopolitical needs, define the solutions that your technology allows you to have, and then make sure the private sector uses it very aggressively to create new industries. Every country can do it. The United States did. The Russians did, but they forgot to give it to private industry. And Dubai is a little country, but I will begin my analysis of geopolitics with something important. In the 1940s and 50s, great powers had to be huge. They had to be huge because the technology of bombers, of bombs, of warfare, had enormous requirements in people. We are now at a point where the number of people that are engaged in geopolitical action, warfare, is much less. Stopping that capability also does not require an America-sized population or China-sized population. It requires a skilled population, a population that is free to invent things, to experiment, to try things. And that is what I would like to urge on, it's not my place to urge anything, but what I think is necessary for Dubai is to understand that you do not have to be a massive power in population to be a great one. Look at Israel. Its population is hardly worth mentioning. It is a decisive force in the region. You're a lie. And one that is becoming globally significant because of the technologies it has. So the first part of what I want to talk about the next 50 years is the last 50. All of these things came to pass. You're using them now. You don't know where they came from. They came from the Ministry of Defense. And your Ministry of Defense is quite capable of inventing things too. Certainly the Israelis were. So having said that, Let's talk a little about major geopolitical shifts. Because people always build, I just said in a panel before, people always believe that this is the worst of times and they invent some past that was peaceful and loving and kind. There was no such time. We are not nice people, we humans. And we don't live in peace. And we must be prepared for war. And in the Ukraine, all of the West so stunned to find out that history hadn't changed. I don't know why. So let's talk about what we mean here, OK? At the end of World War II, an entirely new geopolitical system was created. Japan collapsed. Germany was occupied. Russia was in the center of Europe. The United States was, without any doubt, the leading power in the world. And that existed for a very long time. And we were close to war, and sometimes the Americans went to war foolishly in Vietnam and other places. But the world held together. But nothing in geopolitics is permanent. Everything changes direction. So what direction has changed here? In 1991, an extraordinary year, the Soviet Union collapsed. The Maastricht Treaty was signed, and for the first time, Europe became a unified entity. Operation Desert Storm was carried out here in the neighborhood, setting, releasing the forces of Islamic fundamentalism that ultimately attacked on 9-11 the United States and has wreaked havoc in the region. Japan had a massive economic crisis. It was as stunning as any other. Japan went from being this enormously successful country, almost overnight, to being a failure. And China began its rise to power in 1990-91. All of this happened in one year because all of them were linked together. 
The weakness of the Soviet Union finally gave rise to a Europe that was united because they were not concerned about the Soviet Union, which gave rise to unrest in the Middle East, now that the United States is of a different sort, Japan's crisis, and so on. So between 1945 and 1991, the world changed completely. All right? This happens all the time, but when it happens in your lifetime, as it happened in mine, I was shocked. Shocked, I say. We are now living in 2050 in a very similar time. First, we have discovered that Russia is not a great power. Its economy ranks behind South Korea's. It is a weak economy. Its military has shown itself to be incapable of adequate planning or the execution of a war even if it's at a country as weak as Ukraine. So our vision of what Russia was already damaged in 1991. Uh, that vision is now double down. And whatever the Russians say, we know they couldn't take Kiev. We know that they couldn't take Ukraine. We know that they couldn't survive the sanctions without stumbling. And a third element emerged, which I was surprised by. The reemergence of American power. Power not military, but economic. The power of the dollar, when it was denied to the Russians, when that denial was joined by the Europeans, when it was joined by Japan, by a worldwide coalition, crushed, I would say, Russia's capability to make war. Because wars are expensive. In addition to that, the United States discovered that it was a leader of a le leader of coalitions of NATO, of course, of, NATO, of China as well, of Australia, so on and so forth, that when the war came there, the United States discovered it could lead something it had forgotten and had also discovered that it could wage war without shooting, which was a very important thing to do. So the United States stood back, did not engage, supported the Ukrainians, and made it impossible for the Russians to convert rubles to dollars at the Federal Reserve Bank. And that was the discovery of a new sort of power, which was always there, but we didn't know. So where we are now is a very important place. We've entered a new era. But we can see that we've entered only that era only by looking backwards. In looking backwards, we see this is different from 1945. Looking backwards, we can see this is different from 1991. And therefore, by looking backwards, we can see what's new. If you can't look backwards, you can't imagine what's new. And what are the things that the Americans have, are learning in this? Well, the most important question that the Americans are learning in this is the centrality of space. If we want to know what the Russians are doing, they can't hide it. From space, we can see them. We always knew this, but this is a war in which we could operationalize it. And if the Russians could, they would destroy our satellites, which they always claimed to be able to do, but they couldn't. And so where does war go now? Well, war went with the iPhone into tactical operations on the face of the earth. Now we are in a different time where the real issue is not what happens on the face of the earth, but happens in space. From space, we can see the ground. And on the ground, we can see soldiers. And the soldiers we have seen, we can order to be killed by weapons in space or weapons on the ground or what have you. 
So the geopolitical shift that we see coming out of this, one that will last forever, is that we have now entered space warfare. We have been there really for a long time, being able to spot Soviet satellites or Chinese satellites, they're being able to spot ours. But now space is bound up with warfare on the ground. And therefore, the enemy we have, whoever it is, must destroy our capabilities in space. To command the Earth, you must command space. To command the sea, you must command space. We talk about artificial intelligence, and I'm not sure what that is. I assume that's very good. But from a geopolitical point of view, we think well enough. We don't need help. What we need is space-based systems. And the important thing about space-based systems, and I once met, met, met your Minister of Space, a very pleasant meeting, and you went to Mars, perhaps not on your own technology, but you went. A small nation can become a force in space because it doesn't require 100,000 men in uniform, but maybe 200 to take the technologies that already exist and create something from it. So when we talk about technology and war in general, it comes from war. We can go back to steamships. We can go back to many things. But war creates technology because when you go to war, one, you spend money, and two, it's life and death. And so you get results. We're in a new period. We have seen the decline of Russia, and we are seeing the decline of China. Yes, you will laugh at that idea, but you would have laughed when I said Russia was finished. China is now in its economic end, its final crisis. When the United States began to be an economic power in, 1990, in 20, 1890, it began by selling low-cost, cheap products to the world. By the year 2000, the United States sold one half of all manufactured products in the world. By 1930, it collapsed economically, 40 years later, the Great Depression. It, was, uh, it recovered. Japan, in 1950, began its role as a cheap producer. It became an enormous economic power. And by 1990, 40 years later, it collapsed. The Chinese, economic boom, the Chinese economic boom really ran for 40 years. And now we see the Chinese economy staggering, unable to pay its debts. It's 35% of its economy is uh, real estate, and the largest real estate companies are defaulting on their debts. We will all think this doesn't mean anything. When the United States went into its crisis, we thought, ah, it doesn't mean anything. They'll be better in a week. When Japan went into its crisis, we all thought, well, they'll be better in a week. But they won't be. They will not collapse. They are a great power. They will come out of it. But not in less than 10 years, as the other said. And therefore, what we have to look at there is that China is weakened and weakening whatever it says. Russia is weakening and weakening, and the United States is emerging, but that cannot be the only power. So I will name three powers to you that I expect to rise, and some of them you will laugh at, because I'm always laughed at, that's fine. One is Japan, the world's third largest economy, a significant military, and the United po Population. Number two, Poland. We are already seeing Poland emerge in Europe in this war as the decisive power, as the leader. And Turkey, which was in a terrible economic crisis and is emerging, but is a pivot. I can't explain why I picked these countries, but I picked them 10 years ago. And I said they would emerge in 40, year, in 40 years. 
And 10 years ago, I said, Russia would not be able to hold together after 2020, and China would be an economic crisis. People laughed at me. I like people laughing at me. I like to win. So anyway, look at this next 50 years. It will not look like the last 50 years. It will not have the same technology. It will not have the same culture. It will not have the same players. Do not expect that the next 50 years will be like this, only more so. You've seen the way the world changes. And I have confidence that this country, this to be very strange and interesting country, has the capability of making its own way in that world. And I thank you.